right, welcome back. This is part two of reading George Orwell, Notes on Nationalism, the second and third essay, which uh, make up, well, less than the second half of the book. Um, and as a reminder, in the very beginning of Notes on Nationalism, in his first essay, Orwell complained himself and well, I wouldn't say apologized. He is more. He sounds more frustrated about the fact that there is no proper word to describe this phenomenon, and that he used the word nationalism solely as a stand-in for it seems to be the most accurate of his vocabulary known in his vocabulary at the time of his writing. Um, tribalism is the next word that comes to mind. However, it also does not encompass the phenomenon entirely. It just has another, another overlay um, with, with the phenomenon similar to nationalism. If you put it out as a Venn diagram, you, have, you get three circles overlapping each other somewhat. Um, I do not think we, as of yet, have found a word for this. And that may still take time. It is one of the oldest phenomenon phenomena in the world of, of humanity in our species. This this um, the mental gymnastics of it, and well, for the for the course of this um, book, we will keep running with the word nationalism. So. If you are not, if that, if you do not think this is the correct word, then by all means, try to come up with a better one. Um, maybe leave it in the comments too. Um, the thing with tribalism is, uh, is simply the tribe, uh, a, a positive tribalism, a good tribalism, or rather say a good tribalism, to stay away from Orwell's definition of, of, of positive nationalism. Um, is still able to self-criticize and self-actualize. A good tribalism would still accept dissent within the tribe um, and not immediately ostracize every wrong thinker. The phenomenon that, that, that um, Orwell describes as nationalism, however, would. It is the fanaticism of a religious cult, if you will. We could call it cultism, maybe. I'm not sure. And uh, that word is also already quite loaded. I think this, this may be one of the most important things of our century to figure out, among other things, like what to do about, the, uh, about emotional immaturity and how to, how to, if you will, trigger people out of it and into um, um, maturation. For we seem to have lost that. And these, these very cults that employ... Um, this type of nationalism that, that Orwell is describing, all of the cults, whether they're political or religious or, or um, just cults of personality, they seem to infantilize um, their targets. Whether that is a spouse, a friend, the in-group, the populace. Um, that means stunted emotional development emotional and cognitive development or even reversing it making the people regress um, and in, 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 in personal relationships I have seen this quite often and repeatedly when people got into a relationship with for example a narcissist or even a psychopath borderline is all the time um, but um, you get the idea and I am um, uh, I should get into just reading. When I have com uh, a commentary, I will try to note it as such, um, as well as maybe uh, mention the footnotes as footnotes instead of plainly including them. We'll see. I'm new, I'm, I'm new to this. So let's go. Anti-Semitism in Britain, second essay in Notes on Nationalism. There are about 400,000 known Jews in Britain, 
and in addition some thousands or at most scores of thousands of Jewish refugees who have entered the country from 1934 onwards. The Jewish population is almost entirely concentrated in half a dozen big towns and is mostly employed in the food, clothing and furniture trades. A few of the big monopolies such as the ICI, one or two leading newspapers and at least one big chain of department stores are Jewish owned or partly Jewish owned. But it would be very far from the truth to say that British business life is dominated by Jews. The Jews seem, on the contrary, to have failed to keep up with the modern tendency towards big amalgamations and to have remained fixed in those trades which are necessarily carried out on a small scale and by old-fashioned methods. As a rem uh, commentary, as a reminder, uh, this book was written in 1945, so keep that in mind for any sort of historical descriptions. Back to the text. I start off with these background facts, which are already known to any well-informed person, in order to emphasize that there is no real Jewish problem in England. The Jews are not numerous or powerful enough, and it is only in what are loosely called intellectual circles that they have any noticeable influence. Yet it is generally admitted that anti-Semitism is on the increase, that it has been greatly exacerbated by the war and that humane and enlightened people are not immune to it. It does not take violent forms. English people are almost invar invariably gentle and law-abiding, but it is ill-natured enough, and in favorable circumstances it could have political results. Here are some samples of anti-Semitic remarks that have been made to me during the past year or two. A middle-aged office employee said, I generally come to work by bus. It takes longer, but I don't care about using the underground from, Golden, from Golders Green nowadays. There's too many of the chosen race traveling on that line. A tobacconist woman said, No, I've got no matches for you. I should try the lady down the street. She's always got matches. One of the chosen race, you see. A young intellectual communist or near-communist said, No, I do not like Jews. I've never made any secret of that. I can't stick them. Mind you, I'm not anti-Semitic, of course. A middle-class woman said, Well, no one could call me anti-Semitic, but I do think the way these Jews behave is too absolutely stinking. The way they push their way to the head of queues and so on, they're so abominably selfish. I think they're responsible for a lot of what happens to them. A middle groundsman said, A Jew don't do no work. Not the same as what an Englishman does. He's too clever. We work with this ear. He flexes his biceps. They work with that there. He taps his forehead. Chartered accountant Intelligent, left-wing, in an undirected way, said, These bloody idiots are all pro-German. They change sides tomorrow if the Nazis got here. I see a lot of them in my business. They admire Hitler at the bottom of their hearts. They'll always suck up to anyone who kicks them. And an intelligent woman, on being offered a book dealing with anti-Semitism and German atrocities, said, Don't show it to me. Please, don't show it to me. It'll only make me hate the Jews more than ever. I could fill pages with similar remarks, but these will do to go on with. Two facts emerge from them. One, which is very important and which I must return to in a moment, is that above a certain intellectual level people are ashamed of being anti-Semitic and are careful to draw a distinction between anti-Semitism and disliking Jews. The other is that anti-Semitism is an irrational thing. The Jews are accused of specific offenses, for instance bad behavior in food queues, which the person speaking feels strongly about, but it is obvious that these accusations merely rationalize some deep-rooted prejudice. To attempt to counter them with facts and statistics is useless, and may sometimes be worse than useless. As the last of the above-quoted remarks shows, people can remain anti-Semitic, or at least anti-Jewish, while being fully aware that their outlook is indefensible. 
If you dislike somebody, you dislike him, and there's an end of it. Your feelings are not made any better by a recital of his virtues. It so happens that the war has encouraged the growth of antisemitism and even, in the eyes of many ordinary people, given some justification for it. To begin with, the Jews are one people of whom it can be said with complete certainty that they will benefit by an Allied victory. Consequently, the theory that this is a Jewish war has a certain plausibility. All the more so because the Jewish war effort seldom gets its fair share of recognition. The British Empire is a huge heterogeneous organization. How to get heterogeneous? I'm sorry, the, the word is cut off at a... Uh, makes the line break at a weird space. Um, the British Empire is a huge heterogeneous organization held together largely by mutual consent. And it is often necessary to flatter the less reliable elements at the expense of the more loyal ones. To publicize the exploits of Jewish soldiers, or even to admit the existence of a considerable Jewish army in the Middle East, rouses hostility in South Africa, the Arab countries and elsewhere. It is easier to ignore the whole subject and allow the man in the street to go on thinking that Jews are exceptionally clever at dodging military service. Then again, Jews are to be found in exactly those traits which are bound to incur unpopularity with the civilian public in wartime. Jews are mostly concerned with selling food, clothes, furniture and tobacco. Exactly the commodities of which there is a chronic shortage, which, with consequent overcharging, black marketing and favoritism. And again... The common charge that Jews behave in an exceptionally cowardly way during air raids was given a certain amount of color by the big raids of 1940. As it happened, the Jewish quarter of Whitechapel was one of the first areas to be heavily blitzed, with the natural result that swarms of Jewish refugees distributed themselves all over London. If one judged merely from these wartime phenomena, it would be easy to imagine that antisemitism is a quasi-rational thing, founded on mistaken premises. And naturally, the anti-Semite thinks of himself as a reasonable being. Whenever I have touched on this subject in a newspaper article, I have always had a considerable comeback, and invariably some of the letters are from well-balanced, middling people. Doctors, for example, with no apparent economic grievance. These people always say, as Hitler says in Mein Kampf, that they started out with no anti-Jewish prejudice, but were driven into their present position by mere observation of the facts. Yet one of the remarks of antisemitism is an ability to believe stories that could not possibly be true. One could see a good example of this in the strange accident that occurred in London in 1942, when a crowd frightened by a bomb bust nearby fled into the mouth of an underground station with the result that something over a hundred people were crushed to death. The very same day it was repeated all over London that the Jews were responsible. Clearly, if people will believe this kind of thing, one will not get much further by arguing with them. The only useful approach is to discover why they can swallow absurdities on one particular subject while remaining sane on others. But now let me, let me come back to that point I mentioned earlier, that there is widespread awareness of the prevalence of anti-Semitic feeling and unwillingness to admit sharing it. Among educated people, anti-Semitism is held to be an unforgivable sin and in a quite different category from other kinds of racial prejudice. People will go to remarkable lengths to demonstrate that they are not anti-Semitic. Thus, in 1943, an intercession service on behalf of the Polish Jews was held in a synagogue in St. John's Wood. The local authorities declared themselves anxious to participate in it, and the service was attended by the mayor of the borough in his robes and chain, by representatives of all the churches and by detachments of RAF, home guards, nurses, boy scouts and what not. On the surface, it was a touching demonstration of solidarity with the suffering Jews. 
but it was essentially a conscious effort to behave decently by people whose subjective feelings must in many cases have been very different. That quarter of London is partly Jewish. Antisemitism is rife there, and as I well knew, some of the men sitting round me in the synagogue were tinged by it. Indeed, the commander of my own platoon of home guards, who had been especially keen beforehand, that we should make a good show at the intercession service, was an ex-member of Mosley's Black Shirts. While this division of feelings exists, tolerance of mass violence against Jews or, what is more important, anti-Semitic legislation, are not possible in England. I'm sorry I pronounced that sentence a bit odd. A lot of commata. It is not at present possible, indeed, that anti-Semitism should become respectable. But this is, this is less of an advantage than it might appear. One effect of the persecutions in Germany has been to prevent anti-Semitism from being seriously studied. In England, a brief inadequate survey was made by mass observation a year or two ago. Mass observation is in capital letters, so I suppose it is a publication of some sort. Back to the text. But there but if there has been any other investigation of the subject, then its findings have been kept strictly secret. At the same time, there has been conscious suppression by all thoughtful people of anything likely to wound Jewish sus susceptibilities. After 1934, the Jew joke disappeared as though by magic from postcards, periodicals and the music hall stage and to put an unsympathetic Jewish character into a novel or short story came to be regarded as anti-Semitism. On the Palestine issue, wait, before I get into that, um, a commentary and a sip from my caffeine mug. Oh no, oh no, oh no, I spilled on the book. No. Well, now the book's not a virgin anymore, I suppose. Ah. And I'm not calling it a caffeine mug to be pretentious. It is simply not coffee. <laughs> uh. So, um, what I wanted to comment on is uh, you may see a parallel between this change about uh, media behavior and public behavior in that sense uh, about Jews and a parallel that we have today about depicting women and so-called non-white people. Anyone of a darker skin color, anyone of uh, the current chosen religion, if you will, to draw a parallel to this here, um, cannot be criticized or be shown in any negative light. The source and circumstances may be different, but the mechanics seem to be the exact same. Whether that is for good or bad reasons in either case is, of, is, is a different discussion that you have to answer for yourself. And I am way too tired to make um, thoughtful, thoughtful commentary today, which may be better for then I will get faster through this book. Ah, sorry. So where was I? On the Palestine issue. Oh, great. Uh, on the Palestine issue too, it was uh, de rigueur among enlightened people to accept the Jewish case as proved and avoid examining the claims of the Arabs. A decision which might be correct on its own merits, but, with, but which was adopted primarily because the Jews were in trouble and it was felt that one must not criticize them. Thanks to Hitler, therefore, you had a situation in which the press was in effect censored in favor of the Jews, while in private anti-Semitism was on the upgrade, even to some extent among sensitive and intelligent people. This was particularly noticeable in 1940 at the time of the internment of the refugees. Naturally, every thinking person felt that it was his duty to protest against the wholesale locking up of unfortunate foreigners who for the most part were only in England because they were opponents of Hitler. 
Privately, however, one heard very different sentiments expressed. A minority of the refugees behaved in an exceedingly tactless way, and the feeling against them necessarily had an anti-Semitic undercurrent, since they were largely Jews. A very eminent figure in the Labour Party, I won't name him, but he is one of the most respected people in England, said to me quite violently, We never ask these people to come to this country. If they chose to come here, let them take the consequences. Yet this man would, as a matter of course, have associated himself with any kind of petition or manifesto against the internment of aliens. This feeling that anti-Semitism is something sinful and disgraceful, something that a civilized person does not suffer from, is unfavorable to a scientific approach. And indeed, many people will admit that they are frightened of probing too deeply into the subject. They are frightened, that is to say, of discovering not only that anti-Semitism is spreading, but they themselves are infected by it. To see this in perspective, one must look back a few decades. To the days when Hitler was an out-of-work house painter whom nobody had heard of. One would then find that though anti-Semitism is sufficiently in evidence now, it is probably less prevalent in England than it was 30 years ago. It is true that anti-Semitism as a fully thought out racial or religious doctrine has never flourished in England. There has never been much feeling against intermarriage or against Jews taking a prominent part in public life. Nevertheless, 30 years ago it was accepted more or less as a law of nature that a Jew was a figure of fun and, though superior in intelligence, slightly deficient in character. In theory, a Jew suffered from no legal disabilities, but in effect he was debarred from certain professions. He would probably not have been accepted as an officer in the navy, for instance, nor in what is called a smart regiment in the army. A Jewish boy at a public school almost invariably had a bad time. He could, of course, live down his Jewishness if he was exceptionally charming or athletic, but it was an initial disability comparable to a stammer or a birthmark. Wealthy Jews tended to disguise themselves under aristocratic English or Scottish names, and to the average person it seemed quite natural that they should do this, just as it seems natural for a criminal to change his identity if possible. About 20 years ago, in Rangoon, I was getting into a taxi with a friend when a small ragged boy of a fair complexion rushed up to us and began a complicated story about having arrived from Colombo on a ship and wanting money to get back. His manner and appearance were difficult to place, and I said to him, You speak very good English. What nationality are you? He answered eagerly in his Chichi accent. I am a Jew, sir. And I remember turning to my companion and saying, only partly in joke, he admits it openly. All the Jews I had known till then were people who were ashamed of being Jews, or at any rate preferred not to talk about their ancestry and if forced to do so, tended to use the word Hebrew. The working class attitude was no better. The Jew who grew up in Whitechapel took it for granted that he would be assaulted or at least hooted at if he ventured into one of the Christian slums nearby, and the Jew joke of the music halls and the comic papers was almost consistently ill-natured. Footnote. It is interesting to compare the Jew joke with that other standby of the music halls, the Scotch joke, which superficially it resembles. Occasionally a story is told. For example, the Jew and the Scotsman who went into a pub together and both died of thirst. Which puts both races on an equality. But in general the Jew is credited merely with cunning and avarice, while the Scotsman is credited with physical hardihood as well. This is seen, for example, in the story of the Jew and the Scotsman who go together to a meeting which has been advertised as free. Unexpectedly, there is a collection, and to avoid this, the Jew faints, and the Scotsman carries him out. Here, the Scotsman performs the athletic feat of carrying the other. It would seem vaguely wrong if it were the other way about. Back to the text. 
There was a literary Jew baiting, which in the hands of Belloc, Chesterton and their, f and their followers reached an almost continental level of scurrility. Non-Catholic writers were sometimes guilty of the same thing in a milder form. There has been a perceptible anti-Semitic strain in English literature from Chaucer onwards. And without even getting up from his table to consult a book, I can think of passages which, if written now, would be stigmatized as anti-Semitism. In the works of Shakespeare, Smollett, Thackeray, Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, T.S. Eliot, Aldous Huxley and various others. Offhand, the only English writers I can think of who, before the days of Hitler, made a definite effort to stick up for Jews are Dickens and Charles Reed. And however little the average intellectual may have agreed with the opinions of Belloc and Chesterton, he did not acutely disapprove of them. Chesterton's endless tirades against Jews, which he thrust into stories and essays upon the flimsiest pretexts, never got him into trouble. Sorry. Indeed, Chesterton was one of the most generally respected figures in English literary life. Anyone who wrote in that strain now would bring down a storm of abuse upon himself. Or, more probably, would find it impossible to get his writings published. If, as I suggest, prejudice against Jews has always been pretty widespread in England, there is no reason to think that Hitler has genuinely diminished it. He has merely caused a sharp division between the politically conscious person who realizes that this is not a time to throw stones at the Jews and the unconscious person whose native anti-Semitism is increased by the nervous strain of the war. One can assume, therefore, that many people who would perish rather than admit to anti-Semitic feelings, are secretly prone to them. I have already indicated that I believe anti-Semitism to be essentially a neurosis, but of course it has its rationalizations, which are sincerely believed in and are partly true. The rationalization put forward by the common man is that the Jew is an exploiter. The partial justification for this is that the Jew in England is generally a small businessman, that is to say, a person whose depredations are more obvious and intelligible than those of, say, a bank or an insurance company. Higher up the intellectual scale, anti-Semitism is rationalized by saying that the Jew is a person who spreads disaffection and weakens national morale. Again, there is some superficial justification for this. During the past 25 years, the activities of what are called intellectuals have been largely mischievous. I do not think it an exaggeration to say that if the intellectuals had done their work a little more thoroughly, Britain would have surrendered in 1940, but the disaffected intelligentsia inevitably included a large number of Jews. With some plausibility it can be said that the Jews are the enemies of our native culture and our national morale. Carefully examined, the claim is seen to be nonsense but there are always a few prominent individuals who can be cited to support it. During the past few years there has been what amounts to a counter-attack against the rather shallow leftism, which was fashionable in the previous decade and which was exemplified by such organizations as the Left Book Club. This counter-attack, see for instance such books as Arnold Lund's The, the Good Gorilla or Evelyn Vaux's put out more flags, has an anti-Semitic strain. And it would probably be more marked if the subject were not so obviously dangerous. It so happens that for some decades past Britain has had no nationalist intelligentsia worth bothering about. But British nationalism, for in exemplary nationalism of an intellectual kind, may revive and probably will revive if Britain comes out of the present war greatly weakened. The young intellectuals of 1950 may be as naively patriotic as those of 1914. In that case, the kind of anti-Semitism which flourished among the anti dreyfusards in France and which Chesterton and Belloc tried to import into this country might get a foothold.
I have no hard and fast theory about the origins of anti-Semitism. The two current explanations, that is due to economic causes or on the other hand that, is, that it is a legacy from the Middle Ages, seem to me unsatisfactory. Though I admit that if one combines them, they can be made to cover the facts. All I would say with confidence is that anti-Semitism is part of the larger problem of nationalism, which has not yet been seriously examined, and that the Jew is evidently a scapegoat. Though for what he is a scapegoat, we do not yet know. In this essay, I have relied almost entirely on my own limited experience, and perhaps every one of my conclusions would be ne negatived, negatived by other observers. Negatived. I haven't heard that one in the English language yet. The fact is that there are almost no data on the subject. But for what they are worth, I will summarize my opinions. Boiled down, they amount to this. There is more anti-Semitism in England than we care to admit, and the war has accentuated it. But it is not certain that it is on the increase if one thinks in terms of decades rather than years. It does not, at present, lead to open persecution, but it has the effect of making people callous to the sufferings of Jews in other countries. It is, at the bottom, quite irrational and will not yield to argument. The persecutions in Germany have caused much concealment of anti-Semitic feeling and thus obscured the whole picture. The subject needs serious investigation. Only the last point is worth expanding. To study any subject scientifically, one needs a detached attitude, which is obviously harder when one's own interests or emotions are involved. Plenty of people who are quite capable of being objective about sea urchins, say, or the square root of two, become schizophrenic if they have to think about the sources of their own income. What vitiates nearly all that is written about anti-Semitism is the assumption in the writer's mind that he himself is immune to it. Since I know that anti-Semitism is irrational, he argues, it follows that I do not share it. He thus fails to start his investigation in the one place where he could get hold of some reliable evidence, that is, in his own mind. Commentary. I've left out a few moments of commentary, mainly because I am still quite depleted from the past days. Um, on, on this very thing, um, we see a twisted version of what Orwell was just talking about in what a uh, radical left is doing currently in regards to censorship and self-censorship and, of course, in hubris and perpetuating hubris, almost propagandizing hubris, if you will. Um, that is, um, the, the, um, to reflect upon yourself and see your own flaws is a good thing. It is, it is something um, to better understand the outside and the inside, so the, the world and and your own um, your own mind, your own being. A corrupted version of that, however, are struggle sessions, which are to make you focus on whatever negative uh, thing you see about anything, be it outside, like um, criticizing your own country, or on the inside, like everybody has internalized racism. Or internalized misogyny, or internalized transphobia, or non nonsense like that. And um, you must not um, mix up the two. For one is is the the good. Um, I, virtuous is the wrong term here, uh, but is the is the good and healthy form, and the other is 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 um, the corrupted tool. But it is a tool. You can. With a, I mean, with a with a drill, you can either, either either make a hole in a wall to 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 hang up a painting, or you can drill a hole into the head of someone you don't like. One is a productive use of the tool; the other is a corrupted use of the tool. And I just want to 
And this thought is, is, is relevant to note at this. In this moment, and I'm, I was already tired as hell at 11 a.m., tired as if it was 10 p.m. Not back to the text. It seems, it seems to me a safe assumption that the disease loosely called nationalism is now almost universal. Antisemitism is only one manifestation of nationalism, and not everyone will have the disease in that particular form. A Jew, for example, would not be antisemitic, but then many Zionist Jews seem to me to be merely anti-Semites turned upside down just as many Indians and Negroes display the normal color prejudices in an inverted form. The point is that something, some psychological vitamin, is lacking in modern civilization, and as a result we are all more or less subject to this lunacy of believing that whole races or nations are mysteriously good or mysteriously evil. I defy any modern intellectual to look closely and honestly into his own mind without coming upon nationalistic loyalties and hatreds of one kind or another. It is the fact that he can feel the emotional tug of such things and yet see them dispassionately for what they are. That gives him his status as an intellectual. It will be seen, therefore, that the starting point for any investigation of antisemitism should not be why does this obviously irrational belief appeal to other people? But why does antisemitism appeal to me? What is there about it that I feel to be true? If one asks this question, one at least discovers one's own rationalizations, and it may be possible to find out what lies beneath them. Antisemitism should be investigated, and I will not say by antisemites but at any rate by people who know that they are not immune to that kind of emotion. When Hitler has disappeared, a real inquiry into the subject will be possible, and it will probably be best to start not by debunking antisemitism, but by marshalling all the justifications for it that can be found in one's own mind or anybody else's. In that way, one might get some clues that would lead to its psychological roots. But that antisemitism will be definitely cured without curing the larger disease of nationalism, I do not believe. This is the end of the second essay in George Orwell's Notes on Nationalism. And I will shortly get into the third one. Just need a small break. And I'd just like to get have this all in one uh, recording here. I think is what what Orwell seems to be advocating for is a is an objective examination of a thing, and that may mean you, and that and that means you you may come to. Uh, to a conclusion that yes this group or this belief is is bad or good or neutral or it has many strands that that are one or the other if we map this onto to uh, onto onto the present day we are faced not just with um with the issue of of uh, of jews maybe judaism jewelry as it was called back in the day um uh but also with the the whole question of Israel that I believe was not yet a case in nineteen forty five um but of course probably already in the talks um I am not firm enough on that subject however uh, it seems to be uh, referenced here um For what also should not happen is to is to draw the conclusion that everybody's innocent, and therefore other groups that are seemingly superficially treated the same as the Jews back in the day must also be innocent, and we must ignore all their wrongdoing. 
which of course is something um, that, is, that is also done. It's the other extreme that, that Orwell also also mentioned and talked about, especially in the first um, in the first essay. The uh, which leads to the excuse of of despicable behavior, up to rape, murder, and calls for genocide, and even even destroying a country from within. That is a country and people. I'm sorry, I have a lot of gas in my stomach. Um, and, and, and we cannot find, we cannot ever find a, a, a productive conclusion on how to deal with anything if we are driven by either pure resentment and generalizing, generalizing resentment or generalizing um generalizing excuses making excuses for others uh for that draws into the whole topic of the difference between um forgiveness and mercy um in my book mercy is something you give once that is the um uh, tabula rasa method of okay you fucked up you get one more chance you get no other and, re and and forgiveness requires remorse on the other side while mercy does not forgiveness uh, th th which is why you cannot give mercy more than once for then you are a fool fool me once fool me twice well what happens if when, when fool me thrice fool, was it fool me once shame shame on you fool me twice shame on me this talks about mercy but there are people who let themselves be fooled thrice, or four times, or thirty times. What are they? I say they are perpetually naive and pathological altruists. Who cannot deal with the fact that some people are just scumbags and for whom words mean nothing. You deal then with people, with abusers. Who know they can do anything with you and take anything from you. This is why forgiveness requires requires what was the English word again? Remorse. And a being incapable of remorse cannot be forgiven. Which is why we have so many psychopaths in prison. And sometimes lifelong. For those are incapable of remorse. That they're biologically incapable of remorse. Which is a which is a as scary as it is tragic. And I I can only imagine the pain that a parent must feel when realizing or especially when you understand what psychopathy is and that your child, whatever age then because if you do not diagnose this before 18 um oh god i'm sorry i'm sorry just noises uh this is my noon lunch uh alarm uh when a parent has to recognize my child is a psychopath my child has no feelings my child has no love my child has no remorse that must be a a horrible thing but anyway, yeah. Um, if we are blinded by a form of nationalism, as George Orwell describes it, we will either condemn without mercy and forgiveness, or we will give endless mercy without remorse from the other side and thus be exploited. We will be in an abusive relationship with a despicable being or a despicable group or a despicable, a despicable ideology. Neither of these extremes allows for, for, for a good society, for good living. Balance in everything. Uh, oh, something cheesy like that. All right.
So enough of this interlude. And on with the last essay, which is the shortest. Third essay in Northern Nationalism by George Orwell, 1945. A Disporting Spirit. Now that the brief visit of the Dynamo football team, footnote, the Moscow Dynamos, a Russian football team, toured Britain in the autumn of 1945, playing against leading British clubs, end footnote, has come to an end, it is possible to say publicly what many thinking people were saying privately before the Dynamos ever arrived. That is, that sport is an unfailing cause of ill will and that if such a visit as this ha had any effect at all on Anglo-Soviet relations, it could only be to make them slightly worse than before. Even the newspapers have been unable to conceal the fact that at least two of the four matches played led to much bad feeling. At the Arsenal match, I am told by someone who was there, a British and a Russian player came to blows and a crowd booed the referee. The Glasgow match, someone else informs me, was simply a free-for-all from the start. And then there was the controversy typical of our nationalistic age about the composition of the Arsenal team. Was it really an all-England team, as claimed by the Russians, or merely a league team, as claimed by the British? And did the Dynamos end their tour abruptly, in order to avoid playing an all-England team? As usual, everyone answers these questions according to his political predilections. Not quite everyone, however. I note it with interest as an instance of the vicious passions that football provokes that the sporting correspondent of the Russophile News Chronicle took the anti-Russian line and maintained that Arsenal was not an all-England team. No doubt the controversy will continue f to echo for years in the footnotes of history books. Meanwhile, the result of the Dynamo's tour, in so far as it has had any result, will have been to create fresh animosity on both sides. And how could it be otherwise? I am always amazed when I hear people saying that sport creates goodwill between the nations and that if only the common people of the world could meet one another at football or cricket, they would have no inclination to meet on the battlefield. Even if one didn't know from concrete examples, the 1946 Olympic Games for, for instance, that international sporting contests, le cont contests lead to orgies of hatred, one could deduce it from general principles. Nearly all the sports practiced nowadays are competitive. You play to win, and the game has little meaning unless you do your utmost to win. On the village green, where you pick up sides and no feeling of local patriotism is involved, it is possible to play simply for the fun and exercise. But as soon as the question of prestige arises, as soon as you feel that you and some larger unit will be disgraced if you lose, the most savage combative instincts are aroused. Anyone who has played even in a school football match knows this. At the international level, sport is frankly mimic warfare. But the significant thing is not the behavior of the players, but the attitude of the spectators, and behind the spectators of the nations who work themselves into furies over these absurd contests and seriously believe, at any rate for short periods, that running, jumping and kicking a ball are tests of national virtue. Even a leisurely game of game like cricket, demanding grace rather than strength, can cause much ill will, as we saw in the controversy over body line bowling and over the rough tactics of the Australian team that visited England in 1921. Football, a game in which everyone gets hurt and every nation has its own style of play, which seems unfair to foreigners, is far worse. Worst of all is boxing. One of the most horrible sights in the world is a fight between white and colored boxers before a mixed audience. But a boxing audience is always disgusting, and the behavior of the women in particular is such, is such that the army, I believe, does not allow them to attend its contests. 
At any rate, two or three years ago, when home guards and regular troops were holding a boxing tournament, I was placed on guard at the door of the hall, with orders to keep the women out. In England, the obsession with sport is bad enough, but even fiercer, pas but even fiercer passions are aroused in young countries where games playing and nationalism are both recent developments. In countries like India or Burma, it is necessary at football matches to have strong cordons of police to keep the crowd from invading the field. In Burma, I have seen the supporters of one side break through the police and disable the goalkeeper of the opposing side at a critical moment. The first big football match that was played in Spain about 15 years ago led to an uncontrollable riot. As soon as strong feelings of rivalry are aroused, the notion of playing the game according to the rules always vanishes. People want to see one side on top and the other side humiliated. And they forget that victory gained through cheating or through the intervention of the crowd is meaningless. Even when the spectators don't intervene physically, they try to influence the game by cheering their own side and rattling opposing players with boos and insults. Serious sport has nothing to do with fair play. It is bound up with hatred, jealousy, boastfulness, disregard of all rules and sadistic pleasure in witnessing violence. In other words, it is war minus the shooting. Commentary I believe it obvious that you can map the just described behavior onto social media completely and at the at any any ideological uh, political or religious mob that you will find there as well as nowadays in general media in newspaper articles and so on as they gloat about the superiority of their race and the hatred of another or the superiority of their sex over that of another or the superiority of their um, their, their minority sexuality over that of, of uh, another, especially the um, <laughs> quite quite uh, majority of heterosexual uh, heterosexuality. They have no rules that I abide by. They will hold you accountable to the rules of civic civil society. However, they will not abide by it, of course. They will reject any uh, any in being held to account uh, to those rules in any way with usually the cop out of oh but I'm a minority so it's okay if I do it because of the redefinition of racism that they always uh, that they also uh, use on any other uh, um, um, oppressor versus oppressed um, dichotomy that they make up usually which is uh, the, the uh, power plus privilege um, definition. So it is okay for the underprivileged in that constellation, the, the self-defined underprivileged, to use absolutely every ill behavior in the book and be justified. To, to, be, to be allowed to cheat is justified in, in their eyes. Uh, um, I'll get back to the text. <sighs> Instead of blah blahing about the clean, healthy rivalry of the football field and the great part played by the Olympic Games in bringing the nations together, it is more useful to inquire how and why this modern cult of sport arose. Most of the games we now play are of ancient origin, but sport does not seem to have been taken very seriously between Roman times and the 19th century. Even in the English public schools, the games, the games cult did not start till the later part of the last century, the 19th century. Dr. Arnold, generally regarded as the founder of the modern public school, looked on games as simply a waste of time. Then, chiefly in England and the United States, games were built up into a heavily fin financed activity capable of attracting vast crowds and rousing savage passions, and the infection spread from country to country. It is the most violently combative sports, 
football and boxing that have spread the widest. There cannot be much doubt that the whole thing is bound up with the rise of nationalism. That is, with the lunatic modern habit of identifying oneself with large power units and seeing everything in terms of competitive prestige. Also, organized games are more likely to flourish in urban communities where the average human being lives a sedentary or at least a confined life and does not get much opportunity for creative labor. In a rustic community, a boy or young man works off a good deal of his surplus energy by walking, swimming, snowballing, climbing trees, riding horses and by various sports involved, involving cruelty to animals, such as fishing, cockfighting and ferreting for rats. In a big town, one must indulge in group activities if one wants an outlet for one's physical strength or for one's sadistic impulses. Games are taken seriously in London and New York, and they were taken seriously in Rome and Byzantium. In the Middle Ages, they were played, and probably played with much physical brutality, but they were not mixed up with, polit with politics, nor a cause of group hatreds. If you wanted to add to the vast fund of ill will existing in the world at this moment, you could hardly do it better than by a series of football matches between Jews and Arabs, Germans and Czechs, Indians and British, Russians and Poles and Italians and Yugoslavs. Each match to be watched by a mixed audience of 100,000 spectators. I do not, of course, suggest that sport is one of the main causes of international rivalry. I mixed up there. Okay. Uh, weird page turn. I do not, of course, suggest that sport is one of the main causes of international rivalry. Big scale sport in its, is itself, I think, merely another effect of the causes that have produced nationalism. Still, You do make things worse by sending forth a team of 11 men labeled as national champions to do battle against some rival team and allowing it to be felt on all sides that whichever nation is defeated will lose face. I hope, therefore, that we shan't follow up the visit of the Dynamos by sending a British team to the USSR. If we must do so, then let us send a second-rate team which is sure to be beaten and cannot be claimed to represent Britain as a whole. There are quite enough real causes of trouble already and we need not add to them by encouraging young men to kick each other on the shins amid the roars of infuriated spectators. End. This is certainly... Quite a take on sports ball, if you will. <laughs> um, but I see the issue. Um, I live in a town where the that that had up until a few years ago um, the football field, German football, soccer, you call it, um, where the first game held between West and East Germany was played. And that made me believe that they put a they put a building over it from the local university, and I have never known whether there's even a, a a a plague or what whatever the word is, um, that reminds anyone of the of that. I find this very sad, um, and I may be in dispute with Orwell in this case. I I agree with him that maybe in the moment it can it can be. It can bring resentment, but it also depends on the people playing. In this very case, it was Germans against Germans, a people not truly divided um, by by ideology uh, in 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 and of themselves. For the East Germans, did not really like the ideology put upon them, um, so. It was, I think, it was a special circumstance where it was the. It was the same people play, playing, playing together once more. What I do take from that story, however, is that while not in the moment it may bring peace, but the historical fact that it happened, may do so under special circumstances. 
maybe I'm biased in this whole in this whole regard, and I am not one. I am not into these kinds of sports in the, in the first place. So take my take my opinion on this what you for what you will. But having seen, also having seen the, the hooligan culture here in Germany, uh, especially around football, is um, quite scary. And those types use um, use every opportunity to riot, whether that team wins, whether that team loses. They do not care. Both is a reason to riot, which is something you may see in 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 um, in parallel to how Antifa and BLM are acting. It doesn't matter whether uh, whether Chauvin gets convicted or or is set free. They will take either reason as a justification to riot, either because justice was not served or justice wasn't served enough, or because if he if he was convicted, then it would mean that they were right to, to riot all along, so now they riot more. Because apparently the whole system is broken, while the system just proved that, well, he was convicted, so why uh, that doesn't that prove that the system works as you want it to? It doesn't matter to the rioter. The rioter? For the rioter it only matters can I have a reason to riot. It doesn't need to make sense, it just needs to be a reason. Most people do not need logical reasons, they just need to hear the words do this because, insert whatever. It does not even need to have anything to do with the topic. It's a, it's, if you will, it is a mental trick and people use that mental trick also to brainwash themselves and excuse and justify themselves in their vile acts or in their diminishing of vile acts of others in order to, well, subdue the victim of a, of a, of a raid, for example. Just because they themselves cannot deal with the fact of the world being a dark place, of being a cruel place, and that someone they may be knowing, even personally, is not what that person seemed to be. But I, um, I, I drift off. I get distracted. <sighs> I find these essays very important, and it is a pity that... The conversations discussed in here were never truly had in, in, well, soon to be a hundred years. I think we have to pick up on the work that all will started here. And also figure out a way on how to, how to make people emotionally mature. For I see this type of, of tribalism or nationalism or whatever you want to call the phenomenon mainly with the emotionally immature that is at best second order consciousness as as um, categorized by by robert keegan um, there are other people who work on, on this uh, on these, these kinds of, of um, theories of consciousness um, but this is it's just the first one that comes to mind because it was the first one i stumbled across It is um, the, the sentiment for nationalism, as Orwell describes it, the phenomenon. Maybe I just should just call it for now the phenomenon. Um, has nothing to do with intelligence. It has nothing to do with I IQ. IQ does not prevent you from it. It just gives you different or more complicated reasons to justify it. I, f I believe the I believe these the solution is found in emotional maturity that is not emotional intelligence that is something else um, as far as I'm aware that is um, I'm sorry I'm tired and I'll end the, the recording here. I will not uh, further pester you with my babble. And I'm glad this went over in just one hour instead of two hours as the last time. I hope you enjoyed. And please critique. 
I know this is just a raw recording with all the horrible noises and redoing parts. Maybe one day I'll do things like this in a more capable manner.